morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Todd Copeland and I'm the general manager of Community Futures Middlesex, the Business Help Center. In partnership with Fanshawe College's Center for Research and Innovation, today's webinar is on the topic of agri-tech adoption and food processing innovation. Thank you to Middlesex County, the Workforce Development Partnership and the Workforce Planning and Development Board for sponsorship and support of our workshop series. The goal of this session is to increase awareness for the funding programs and services available to support individuals and agribusinesses looking to pursue new opportunities or overcome challenges that they've encountered. Before we get started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Please keep your microphones on mute to limit distractions. Should you have any questions or comments, we ask that you raise your hand or use the chat function and we'll do our best to address and accommodate all questions and concerns, including questions and answers uh, period at the end. Lastly, it's important to note that we'll be recording this session and uploading the video content to our YouTube channel and website. So if you don't wanna be captured on the internet for uh, I guess the rest of time, uh, we encourage you to leave your camera off. For today's agenda, I'll provide a brief introduction, introducing or discussing the agricultural landscape in Ontario and Middlesex County. I'll then introduce everyone to Murray Good, the president and owner of, the white, of white, both White Crest Mushrooms and Mycionics, to share his story on innovating his agribusiness. After Murray's story, I'll provide an overview of Community Futures Middlesex, including our impact and client success stories related to innovation in the agricultural sector. I'll then pass it over to Colin Yates, who's the chair for Fanshawe College's research, uh, Center for Research and Innovation, to talk about the resources and services available through his organization. To start, let's look at how the agricultural sector impacts our economy across Ontario. We'll also look at how agribusiness support Middlesex County's economy and projected trends in the local sector over the next decade. These trends may reveal, may reveal new opportunities as well as solutions to emerging problems and further highlight why we're hosting today's session. According to MAFRA's 2017 Agricultural Economic Development uh, Resource Guide for Communities, Ontario's agricultural sector contributes approximately 37 billion in GDP to the provincial economy. This is based on its value chain that encompasses primary, secondary, and tertiary impacts on the economy. More than 49,000 farms in Ontario employ approximately 94,500 workers, which represents 11.5% of employment in Ontario. Additionally, 98% of these farms are owned and operate, operated independently by families. It's also worth noting that Ontario encompasses more than half of all prime, prime agricultural land in Canada, producing over 200 agricultural commodities, an asset or re resource worth protecting. As alluded to on the previous slide, Ontario's agricultural value chain shows that the sector's impact on our economy spreads far beyond just the inputs and production of agricultural goods. In fact, the most significant contribution is during the processing and distributing of agricultural goods. It also impacts the businesses and retailers that market, promote, and sell agricultural goods, ultimately impacting consumers through the provision of access to these goods. Ontario is considered a leader in productivity, research, and development within the agricultural sector, with new technologies continually developed in the province. These technologies are adopted by not only local businesses, but are exported to agribusinesses in other provinces and countries. As a result of the funding and resources dedicated to innovation and the adoption of new technologies in Ontario, the sector will continue to grow. Some of the most significant innovations and in rates of technology adoption in Ontario's agricultural sector, and across Canada for that matter, are happening in Middlesex County. When adjusted for size, there are four times as many workers and agribusinesses here compared to the national average. According to the 2016 census data, which is the latest um, uh, on agriculture, 64% of agribusinesses in Middlesex County reported using digital technology exceeding the national and provincial averages of 56%. Through its recent workforce strategy project, the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus estimates an employment growth rate of 1% in Middlesex County's agricultural sector between 2020 and 2023. Moreover, nearly one third of workers within the sector could retire by 2020, 2030. 
two broad-based solutions to combat this and are, are encouraging self-employment and further innovating through technology adoption within Middlesex County's agricultural sector. These solutions will be the key to sustaining and growing the local sector, as well as, as, well as Middlesex County's economy as a whole. One excellent example of an agribusiness innovating to overcome these challenges is in Middlesex County is Whitecrest Mushrooms, owned and operated by President Murray Good. Murray's been the president and owner of Whitecrest Mushrooms since purchasing the property in 2002. His business produces over 2 million pounds of brown cremini and portobello mushrooms for the Ontario Fresh Market. Through his investment in research and development projects, he eventually founded Mycionics in 2014 and continues to innovate his business with support of numerous partners, including Fanshawe College's Centre for Research and Innovation. As a leader and expert with expertise within the industry, he's also past president of Mushroom Canada. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce a Community Futures Middlesex client of the past and the present, Murray Good of White Crust Mushrooms and Mycionics. Uh, thank you very much, Todd. Um, I think I'm Murray Good, White Crest Mushrooms. Like we're located just outside of Dorchester, Ontario. We're in the very far corner of Middlesex uh, County, but we're still in Middlesex. Right? We can throw a stone and hit the edge. Um, yeah, I, what I'd like to do is, uh, we've, you've been introduced to, uh, I, I'll talk about why we did Mycionics. So I think what we'll do, Todd, if you could play that minute and a half video of kind of an introduction to Mycionics and give some visuals, that'd be great. And then we can talk about why we did it and how we're doing it and what the future looks like for us. Great, Murray. That's I'll just great. Get, yeah, I'll get that queued up for you. One second. Okay. So when the video, you'll see, uh, oh, there we go. Good. That was quick. Perfect. I'll let it play. What if you could reverse your diabetes without meds or a special diet in just four weeks by <laughs> Perfect. Okay, whatever that was. Uh, yeah, so we're good. Everybody was able to see the video. Um, I guess we'll focus on why, what we saw back in 2012-13, why we started to look at uh, robotic harvesting, and I think agriculture with any intensive labor is that we were running out of people. A couple reasons, no buses come to the countryside. And um, this one second, sorry. Hilda, could you close that? Um, yeah, that we just can't get the people out here. We weren't attracting uh, people to our farm out in the country. So, uh, we realized we have to go robotic and we ended up contacting OCE and OCE uh, set us up with Western University and um, got us going on the path that we're at, uh, working with Western, uh, uh, developing the harvesting system. Our biggest 
uh, portion of our income or our gross income goes towards uh, labor. We were 42% of our gross income were paying for labor to be able to harvest our mushrooms. So over the years of developing it since 2014, uh, we're discovering a lot of uh, the technology wasn't there in 2014. We realized we had to develop it ourselves and be able to to be able to see the mushrooms on the beds. You see how tight it was. You've seen there's only about 30 centimeters of room and I thought that was a good thing, but that's a bad thing for cameras, uh, traditional off the shelf. So we ended up developing our own laser slash uh, visual uh, camera system to be able to read in that shorter one. Uh, the also, the other issue was removing the mushrooms from the, from the room. And that's where we developed the packer that hangs on the side of the bed that will receive the mushroom, cut the stem, weigh the mushroom individually, and then weigh it as a, as a bulk uh, container also. So that way, and then it goes into the cassette, remove, then one person comes in, takes 16 uh, uh, baskets from the room, and then puts in empties, and the robot goes again. So uh, we're looking from a, from a savings of of dollars, we are looking at a reduction of about 40% to 50% reduction in cost uh, with paying the robotics company. So Mycionics was set up by Whitecrest. So we're actually gonna be the first customer of uh, Mycionics. So we'll end up paying them. But the neat thing about moving the robotics in the agriculture industry, when we're picking 24 hours a day, and this is more specific to mushrooms, but could be carried into more hort, like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. In the mushroom industry, mushrooms grow 4.2% an hour. We see that when we, when, we, when we scan the beds, it takes us 40 minutes to scan all, four, all seven beds. Uh, they're 30 meters long. They grow 4.2% an hour. So the advantage of harvesting 24 hours a day is that we're getting the mushrooms at optimum size, which is 55 millimeters and around 45 grams of uh, weight. So we're actually getting a 20, minimum 20% 20 increase in yield. So that really kind of got us excited because we don't have any more inputs and we end up uh, getting a 20% increase in yield because we're harvesting at the optimum time, two in the morning, three in the morning, where the uh, human harvesting, that wasn't possible. We just, people won't work those shifts. It's just simple, we must admit it. Um, so with that, that's been a bonus, but there's been so many other things that we're finding when we work with the mushrooms over 24 hours, as far as, uh, how the mushroom reacts and what it does and what uh, we're learning so much about mushrooms, which we never could before, which is human harvesting. So, so the neat thing is that increase in yields pays for our robotic, uh, the cost of our robotics. Uh, Mycionics is charging on a per pound basis. Uh, we don't sell the units. We're actually licensing the units to the farm. So they don't have to invest two, three million, to be for three million for our farm. Uh, Mycionics will take that, that uh, capital expenditure and then just uh, charge by the pound. Uh, and that kind of keeps everybody motivated. White Mycionics wants to pick as many mushrooms as possible. The farmer wants to pick as many mushrooms as possible. So it's kind of a triple win. I just got to call my mom and said, you know how to set it? I'm coming between oh. Tom and two. Do you know how to set it up? And she said, no, he's look. Okay. Well, maybe I can help with it. Anyways. Um, I'm going to yeah, head over. So that's, so I got to get stuff from Mike's. That's been some of the happy accidents uh, that we found once we started the work with universities and Fanshawe and all that stuff uh, that the big advantage is bringing technology into the agricultural industry is something we've done it in field work with, you know, GPS and all that stuff, but uh, in horticulture and that it really hasn't been done. And it's a massive market that I think a lot of robotics companies are looking at. Uh, just a short story on that is uh, when we started working with the universities, the university said mushroom farmers don't know how to pick robotically, but the professors that we worked with, Dr. Kermani, uh, realized you need to have the farmer to understand the mushroom to be able to pick it. And that's where we had an advantage over other companies. Robotic guys were coming in and trying to pick mushrooms. They don't know what mushrooms do. So that's where we really gained a lot of traction. 
uh, and speed. It really, it's been, what, seven years, but still that's pretty fast for the issues and it's never been done before. So that was kind of a really godsend as far as the professors realizing that we have to work with both the robotics company, the university, and us. Uh, we work with uh, Connexio out of London, great partner on that to help develop it together. So, and the university who helped us find those people too. So it's, it's been a bit of a bonus. Um, the other part, working with the colleges in that and Fanshawe is developing the human resources to be able to maintain and uh, build the units uh, to find that brain bank out of the neat thing with Western is the people that were in the lab that was working with Dr. Kamani were already pre-selected. They were the best of the best. They were the top guns in the university. So that was beautiful. And we're, we're looking at the colleges that people that really want to work in the labs there and, and help Mycionics develop their rollout of commercialization will be the best of the best too. So it's a nice triage. I think that's the right reference to be able to find the best of the best of the category of people we're looking at. And that would be, that's a, an incredible bonus for us as a company working with the, uh, the local education systems. So, so yeah, um, that's about all we're fully we're picking up so where we're at right now in commercialization we've got all the units built they're all tied together they're working and we're getting data from them they're picking our third breaks which is we pick first break uh second and third over three weeks our first break uh yields about 60 percent second does 30 and 10 10 percent in the third so the robotics are picking starting in December here, our third breaks, so they'll move back into the second and then hopefully, and then to the first by probably March, April of 2022. And then we'll be fully robotic by then. So which would be good because we are struggling. We're down six harvesters, um, foreign labor issues as far as the government and it's the speed to bring in people. I'm sure everybody on the call realizes if you are using foreign labor, it is, incredibly it's a good system we wouldn't be in business without it let's put it that way um we know we can't get any more local talent uh people don't want to do it anyways we'll leave that alone um but uh there still is issues with the foreign labor uh as far as government uh restrictions on bringing people in and stuff so we are struggling right now until the robotics come in to be able to harvest all our mushrooms which is a big issue for us but uh Okay, I'll leave. I think questions are left till the end. Is that right, Todd? Yeah, I think we, that's what we can do. Uh, unless there's a, a specific question right now that anyone has that wants to bring it forward for Murray. If not, uh, I encourage you to, to type it into the chat box or, or uh, raise your hand at any point and, uh, and, and um, save the question. We'll, we will have a dedicated question and answer period at the end. So it's good. So uh, let me get back to the presentation here. Um, Andrew, can you remove the spotlight for Murray? He's on full screen on mine. Or, or can you see my presentation is the question. No, nope. no, you'll just have to share your screen again, Todd, and then it'll come oh, right up. Okay, all right, yeah, sorry. Uh, one second. How's that? Is that full screen? Can you see that, Andrew, now? Uh, it is not full screen. It's the presenter view right now. Okay. One second. It's always uh, the technology side of things, right? So... <clears throat> While we got that going, Todd, uh, there is a question from Joe Dales. Uh, what are the toughest challenges you have had to overcome in, the, in developing an innovative ag tech startup company like Mycionics? Did you want to address that, Murray? Yeah, sure. Um, the biggest technical, uh, let's call it socioeconomic, maybe that's not the right word either. It comes down to it, uh, people saying it can't be done. And that was probably the biggest hurdle. 
um, we stumbled at, like from the university and that lab, we picked up two brilliant students that said it could be done. And uh, it was amazing the difference in the, the ability to see the opportunities to get the, the system off the ground and running. So even today, there's other farm, mushroom farmers are saying you can't do it. They're still saying that and we're showing them removing mushrooms from the bed, but it's attitude. I think the biggest thing is our, our students that we got, we have 19 engineers working now and that those two students have set the attitude for the following 19. He's our, one of them is our CTO now and he's kind of leading the group and it's amazing that he brings in people that have that can-do attitude and uh, that's been the exciting part so yeah uh, from a technological like I said it was the cameras they weren't used to dealing within 30 and uh, sub 30 centimeter ranges um, the rest is uh, the programming uh, the algorithms and stuff like that you wouldn't, couldn't buy it off the shelf which is kind of nice. We have uh, we've adopted some of Vineland's. We've taken over their patents. They had four, and then we developed four of our own that we patent within the uh, from the physical to we didn't patent the algorithms because we can keep them secret. So it was kind of nice we could develop our own that way nobody else can uh, can copy this. We do need competition. I'm not saying we don't. We can't cover the world. There's 1.2 billion pounds picked in the US and 250 million pounds picked in Canada. And we are growing actually 4 million pounds a year. So we're one of the smaller growers, but we consider ourselves one of the biggest innovators in the industry. So yeah, hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay. thank you. Hi, thanks Joe. Um, is everyone seeing full screen now? Yeah, that looks great, Todd. It does? Okay, good. I've got multiple monitors going here and I sometimes get uh, lost in them. So so thanks for uh, taking the time to be with us, Murray. I'm sure everyone will find uh, the story very informative and inspirational as well as help us better understand what it takes to, to innovate and succeed within the agricultural sector. So next I'm gonna uh, provide a quick overview of Community Futures Middlesex, including who we are, uh, the region we serve and what we do. So in case you're unfamiliar with us, uh, our team works to achieve uh, the objectives of the Community Futures Program in Middlesex County. Uh, we support rural entrepreneurs and business owners through financing, consulting, and training. Uh, we're primarily funded by the federal government through FedDev Ontario, uh, giving us significant capital to invest in local businesses. Our team consists of business professionals who live and work in Middlesex County with all of the decisions made by people who truly understand our local communities. Uh, due to such a broad geographic area that we, are, that we have to cover in Middlesex County, in response to the pandemic, we turned to digital and social media as our primary communication tools like many other people over the last uh, uh, year and a, and a half or more. So as restrictions are gradually eased, we're looking to expand our uh, physical presence beyond our main office in Ilderton. The business that we support are located within the horseshoe that surrounds the city of London, consisting of eight lower tier municipalities. Uh, we can support your business if you operate in any of these rural communities. So the key here is it's outside the city of London limits. When it comes to what we do, our team provides four main services. Whether your business is starting up or expanding, we can help guide you through our consulting and, cons and, and counseling services. Our consulting services often goes hand in hand with our small business financing services. Um, so we offer micro loans of up to $30,000 and small business loans of up to $300,000 uh, from the two internally managed investment funds that we, that we manage uh, to meet your unique needs. We also believe in collaboration over competition, which is why we're dedicated to collaborating with local and regional partners, such as financial institutions, credit unions, including Fanshawe College as, as we are today, uh, to facilitate community economic development. Lastly, we provide educational services through workshops and webinars, uh, you know, much like today, uh, training that's led by uh, subject matter, ex magic matter experts um, uh, to set up local entrepreneurs and businesses for success. Through our business consulting and financing services, 
we've emphasized supporting innovative businesses that are either adopting new technology themselves or helping other businesses in their adoption of new technology. Looking at a snapshot of our loan portfolio at the end of 20, 2021 uh, fiscal year, you can see that despite investing more than 5 million in local businesses, we still have nearly 4 million to continue to invest in the county. In terms of innovation, 23% of our loans was dispersed to businesses fostering the adoption of new technology products and service offerings. We hope to push the needle on our loan portfolio and increase that percentage that's invested in priority sectors by the end of our current fiscal year. When the distribution of our loans portfolio is broken down by priority sector, we mostly impacted advanced manufacturing, agri-food and food processing businesses within the innovation space. In fact, each sector accounted for 11.3% of our loans portfolio. So these numbers closely align up with the 23% innovation rate that we reported at the end of our last fiscal year. Aside from looking at the, the data of our impact, we also wanted to share a few more success stories uh, of, of, who, of clients that have facilitated innovation or succeeded in the food processing industry. So despite the success opening an Italian style cafe in London, Jeff and Vivian Swan decided to pivot Copa Gelata into a prepackaged model a few years after opening in 2004. They moved to a production facility in Kamoka and eventually to a larger location in Strathroy after continued success. They received financial support from Community Futures Middlesex at this time, expanding Copa Gelata and building a strong relationship with our organization in the process. Jeff often, I've heard him refer to us as our Community Futures Middlesex as a very comfortable and helpful and supportive lender. Copa Gelata is now located in a 12,500 square foot facility back within the city of London. However, it was their growth in rural Middlesex County that first established the business. And as a result, their gelato and sorbet can be found in some of the largest grocers, including Sobeys and Farm Boy. When Leesboro Central Public School closed in 2009, Thorndale, Thorndale's residents couldn't have predicted what the building would eventually become. In 2018, a former student came, came along and had, res, had it rezoned to operate a multi micro cultivator of cannabis for medicinal and now the recreational market. Meet Rob O'Neill, the principal and CEO of JC, JC Green. Much of Rob's inspiration for JC Green came from his late brother's vision for a cannabis cultivator. The O'Neill family has a deep rooted history in the Thorndale community and agricultural sector. Rob and his family have experienced many setbacks motivating and fueling his efforts with JC Green. As a young entrepreneur, Rob needed financial backing from an alternative lender like Community Futures Middlesex. He has quickly established JC Green as recognized brand in the cannabis industry and himself as a bankable entrepreneur, while still maintaining his core values as a community focused business. At a young age, Joan Hepburn fell in love with butter tarts. She and her friend Stephanie would buy them at a local corner store with the money they earned from their paper route. Joan would later become a talented baker, but soon found out she is celiac, motivating her to, motivating her to create the best gluten-free pastries around. After Stephanie passed away in 2018, Joan started Joni's Pastries to honor her late childhood friend. She started out by renting a church's kitchen selling her pastries at markets and winning awards at festivals across uh, southwestern Ontario and beyond. The demand for Joan's pastries grew beyond her, beyond her wildest dreams. Joan decided to open up a storefront in London, obtaining financial support from Community Futures Middlesex uh, to, to lead up to that, officially opening in September 2019. With five-star ratings on Google, Facebook and other review sites, Joni's Pastries is loved by customers with and without celiac and other gluten sensitivities. If you'd like to connect with us, here's our contact information. It's business as usual. We are scheduling in-person and virtual meetings and consultations. We eventually look forward to officially opening our new office space that's located on the down, I guess downtown Ilderton and, and welcoming you to it, which we have occupied since the start of the pandemic. The best way to get in touch with us is by email or phone. You may also visit our website to learn more about what we do and to keep up with the latest. You can also connect with us on our social media platforms, including our YouTube channel, where you'll eventually find a recording of today's session. We are also present and active on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. With that, 
I will now hand it over to Colin Yates, who's the chair for the Center for Research and Innovation at Fanshawe College. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Todd, for the introduction, and, and the, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, great to see so many people joining in on the uh, the webinar. We'll just uh, chat away here while Andrew brings up the presentation. Um, but it, it's great to see so many examples of, of companies that uh, Fanshawe is working with, including having uh, Murray here as well, who uh, we just finished up a project with. Um, we'll... I can't control things on my end here for some reason, Andrew, so you'll be controlling it. <laughs> Perfect. So if you're unaware of applied research in the, the college perspective, uh, uh, we, we all, we're all about applied research. So that is taking some of these great concepts and uh, early designs, like uh, Murray was suggesting from uh, Western that were, they started developing with them and helping them helping these companies commercialize uh, or taking an existing product service that they have and they need to scale it. Uh, we step in and we help them figure out how to scale that product as, as efficiently as possible. So the reason why applied research exists at colleges is, is primarily for that economic development uh, mandate. Uh, we, we don't exist for the, uh, for the concept of basic research alone. We, we are here and we are funded uh, to help companies uh, like uh, JC Green and, and others uh, that have been mentioned today. Go ahead, Andrew. And, and of course, uh, as Todd rightly said, you know, the, and, and others have said, this is all about partnerships. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things we do without uh, strong partnerships from funders like NSERC and Tsunami. Uh, bioenterprise and of course I saw Joe here uh, with some comments uh, RH accelerator of course is a great partner in the region for supporting these companies and when we all bring our resources together we can do some amazing things go ahead there Andrew perfect um, so as I said uh, you know our, our vision is is, is very clear we, we have uh, an R&D mandate uh, to support uh, the potential of not just uh, companies here in southern Ontario and around London in particular, but we actually help companies uh, commercialize uh, all across Canada now. Uh, we're working with companies in Halifax all the way to uh, Alberta in, in our portfolio. And, and a lot of these companies uh, are particularly agri-food companies. About 80% of the projects that we do now are in the agri-food space and really in the food processing space. And that, that's really become our focus and, and uh, where our strengths are. So I, I will, uh, leading in with the agri-food component, the services that we provide are proof of concept product development, uh, we do mostly product testing and validation. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're using Joni's uh, uh, bakery as an example, maybe they want to look at shelf life uh, testing. They want to see how far they can ship their product across Canada and get as to much market as they can. They could approach us and we could help them sort out some of their potential shelf life issues or just simply evaluate actually what their shelf life is, uh, both from a microbial perspective as well as what is the um the oxidative taste so that's when some of those fats and oils start to break down and they have that kind of funky taste so that's a uh, an oxidative shelf life a big thing that's happening right now in the food industry uh is the absence of some ingredients uh with uh supply chains breaking down with covid and, and other uh shortages that have been happening out there we're helping companies develop new formulations for their recipes uh, so that they can add another ingredient in there that works equally as well so they can still continue to grow and expand or in some cases just simply continue to operate. Um, that's become a very popular thing over the last little bit. And another big thing that we've been working on with a lot of companies is process optimization. For a lot of these small companies, they're getting to the point where they've been a, a family company for a long time and now maybe the next generation is coming on they see the opportunity to scale this company, but you know maybe they're only making uh, 
you know, 3,000 a week and they need to get to 6,000 a week in order to be able to make that scale happen. So we come into their plant and we help them figure out where they can uh, improve and uh, uh, become more efficient with either what they have or we uh, recommend to them what they need to change in there uh, to get the biggest bang for their buck. And you'll see Mustafa on the call here. He's our, our process engineer that does a lot of these projects. And uh, we've been helping some great local companies like the Fritter Shop uh, really scale. You can scoot ahead there, Andrew. So believe it or not, we have some pretty amazing lab facilities at Fanshawe College. And this is at the main Oxford Street campus. Uh, we've expanded from uh, just under uh, uh, 2,000 square feet of lab space up to about 3,000 square feet of lab space in the past year. And all of this is dedicated to industry research projects and helping, and, and as well as testing and helping these companies uh, be able to innovate as quickly as possible. So what I say is industry projects, that there's no academic activity going on in here. This is specifically for food innovation, these labs. And you'll see some of the equipments on the side there. I don't expect you to know any of them or anything like that, but, uh, uh, basically, they're, they're designed from a process perspective, and they've been brought in from a process perspective so that we can actually develop some of these products in-house for these companies. Um, like, for example, we're, we're working with new companies in the area like uh, Aspire, uh, which is the, um, the cricket protein company, um, other companies like Booch. Uh, kombucha to help them with their fermentation process um, and uh, a lot of cannabis companies as well that's a, a big area a big uh, uh, a big uh, uh, contributor to us right now and some of the opportunities in the food sector go ahead Andrew So as I mentioned, the, the cannabis is becoming a, a big area for us. We're, we're one of the few uh, institutions or academic institutions with a cannabis research license in Ontario or even in Canada. And uh, a lot of the companies that come to us are interested in finding ways to integrate uh, cannabis product uh, into food or their food company wanting to figure out how they can get into the cannabis industry and have a, a cannabis product line as well. Um, so we, we work closely with these companies in order to uh, uh, make sure that they do it safely, uh, make sure that their process that we provide to them or, or, or develop for them is scalable so that they can uh, take it to the market. Uh, we, we just recently worked with a coffee company that is coming out with a very interesting uh, CBD coffee like drink. Um, of course, I mentioned Aspire and Booch, Organic Kombucha already. Uh, the Fritter Shop is a, an amazing example of a, a regional company that is doing some uh, great growth and have moved into the Grove at Western Fair, uh, which we're proud to be a partner of and uh, support a lot of the, the local entrepreneurs uh, as they grow and scale. Go ahead there, Andrew. So the part that uh, everybody uh, wants to know about is, you know, how do we do all these projects and how do we, we partner with companies? And this comes down to be able, being able to provide a lot of these companies uh, funding. Um, and this comes in the form of grants. Uh, so we have two grants that are actually in-house right now, uh, one through NSERC, which is the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And the other is Tsunami, which is a Fed Dev sponsored program. And uh, these programs are designed to help companies either test or create uh, new products, and particularly in the agri-food space. Uh, the Tsunami program is advanced manufacturing as a whole, but given our background in agri-food, we, we tend to focus just on that area. And the, the great part about this funding is it really de-risks uh, the innovation process uh, for these companies by covering up to 75% of the project costs for eligible companies. So that means that if a company, uh, we sit down with this company and uh, it ends up being a $10,000 project, they only have to contribute about $2,500 in cash. The rest is made up in in-kind contributions. So for example, if it's a cannabis company we're working with, 
they would be providing cannabis product to us, that would be considered as an in-kind contribution because we're utilizing that product is gonna be destroyed at the end. Um, so that quickly covers that in-kind contribution. So it's a great way for these companies to de-risk what they're doing. And the great part about working with the college is there's no loss of IP. We don't take any intellectual property from these companies. So they retain all of it as part of this granting program. And of course, the, the best part about it is the amount of funding. Uh, up to $100,000 can be used per project. And a company can use get access to this funding year after year after year. There, there's no limit on the, the amount that they can use. I'll have you skip ahead there, perfect. So uh, I, I encourage people to reach out to us. I know Andrew will be uh, sharing uh, this presentation with everybody uh, following our, our presentations today. So please do reach out to us if you have questions or you have ideas of projects that you wanna do or uh, you wanna find a way to collaborate in, in some manner. We're, we're always open to a, a, a discussion and finding ways that we can continue to serve uh, the agri-food scene in London and uh, Canada as a whole. Thank you very much. If you have any uh, questions for us, uh, uh, I, I think we still have about 15 minutes here. So there's time for questions for everybody, I think, Todd. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't see any new questions in the, in, the, uh, in the chat box here yet, but I encourage people to uh, type them in or, or feel free to take, uh, if you, if you take your camera, set your camera on or take yourself off a of mute and just uh, step up and ask your question. Uh, would be anyone here would be open to any questions that you might have. Hi, Colin, Joe Dales. Uh, how long does it take to, to put up uh, an idea into a project and, and push through your system approximately? Uh, hi Joe, good to see you. Uh, good question. Uh, it all depends on the, the the type and scale of the project. We do so many different shelf life projects right now that we, we push them out in a matter of a few weeks um, to get started. Um, so how, how that process works is when that company comes with the concept or the challenge uh, that they have, we sit down and scope that exercise. Um, we ensure that they're eligible for the funding. And then once they agree on the scope of work uh, and they sign off on it, they have to provide their uh, cash contribution uh, to the project. And then that initiates the start of a project. Because we have that funding in-house, there's no actual grant application that has to be done here where you're waiting weeks. It, it can happen all very quickly as uh, I'm sure Wayne can attest to. Thanks for your question, Joe. Yeah, Murray Goodyear, same uh, presenter. Um, as far as the validity of a project, what's the what's the guidelines? I guess as far as if a project would be eligible or not. Like, I guess it just comes down to submit it and let the let Fanshawe decide, or how's that process done? Yeah, it's based on our capability, right? Um, we don't take on projects that we feel we, we aren't comfortable with. Uh, we want to make sure that we can bring the right team to the table um, with the right expertise. And then we, if we can't do it, we'll try to uh, introduce you to somebody in our network that can. Perfect. A question for you, Colin. Uh, just related to these projects as well. Is there an ideal time, like length of project that's well suited to the fan shot, like the college model? Most of our uh, most of the projects that we do are around six months in length. Uh, it's it's rare that any of them go over a year. So kind of that four to six months is what is typically asked for. Um, it's not that we can't do longer. It's just that seems to be, uh, you know, the pathway that most companies are taking. Um. So we're just, uh, we've got uh, a few minutes left here. If there's any further questions, uh, 
If not, we can um, definitely, uh, hopefully everyone found the, uh, the information that was presented today, uh, both by Murray, um, you know, myself and Colin, uh, useful. I think there is, um, you know, significant opportunity, I think, in the agricultural sector. And I think uh, hopefully uh, this having hosted this webinar today um, kind of demonstrated that there is, uh, you know, I, I think there's opportunity here to, to reach out and, and seek assistance or support from, you know, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, you're thinking about an idea, you're looking for business adv advice or support, um, or, you know, you might have a specific project in mind, uh, and you might not have been aware of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the uh, I guess, the direction the college is going and, and becoming a, you know, a center of excellence for research and, uh, and food processing and innovation and cannabis spaces and anything agriculture. So I think, uh, you know, if there isn't any further questions, I'm seeing some some great feedback in the chat box coming up. Uh, but uh, we can definitely um, we'll be following up. Uh, both Fanshawe and myself will will follow up uh, with uh, a link to the to the full recording of this webinar, and uh, we'll also you know share with uh, all the attendees uh, copies of the presentation and uh, make sure that you have our contact details or information if there is further follow-up uh, from either from either group. But uh, it's been great to spend this morning, I guess, a, a little bit shy of an hour. It's not uh, overly lengthy, but I think there's a lot of good content here presented uh, by everyone, and uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed it. And, uh, and um, you know, keep in touch with us and, and follow, uh, follow this, you know, future webinars or there might be, you know, new products or things like that, that we're being to be introducing in the future that, uh, that are specific to supporting uh, opportunities in this, in this space. So. I think Wayne had a question there. He might've had his hand up. Yep. Yeah, Colin, it's, it's Maria. Um, if we Murray, have a multi-year program, what we're finding is, and the whole thing with robotics is finding talent. It, it, within Fanshawe, if we, example, crazy example, we're looking at uh, working with a U.S. company on vegan bacon using mycelium, oyster mycelium to create a vegan bacon. As far as getting talent or developing courses that would uh, support that over multiple years to enhance that industry, is that something Fanshawe would uh, create a course around or maybe it's not a good example, but if it's really developing, there's a lot of new tech that's coming that we don't have the talent for. Is that something that Fanshawe could adapt to and create courses around? That's a great question, Murray. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in the academic side. I'm more on the research side, but I, I do know that we, we do our best to try and uh, uh, connect with industry uh, on areas uh, where uh, we need more talent in the region to be trained on. Uh, we're, the even though it's kind of a misnomer, the culinary program is, is doing a lot of developing in the food processing uh, area uh, as an example for the region, because there is such a demand for uh, skilled labor in that space. Um, I'm, I can't speak to the robotic side as much, um, but they, they do try to look at the industry needs and try to partner. But uh, I, I would suggest if there's a particular niche, uh, you know, reach out to us and I will put you in touch with the right person to speak to rather than myself. Great, thanks. It's, yeah, even if you've got a lot larger network than what I would to uh, look at different technologies, what's out there. Appreciate that. Thank you. We did another we question. Have... We have a Go question ahead. from Ola, from OFA with Shanice. Um, What areas would colleges like to see projects in and maybe where are you currently working or seeing projects that we're not currently in? That's a great question, Janice. Um, uh, mo most of the projects that we're, we're really busy taking on, uh, as I said, right now are in that uh, um, uh, nutritional and shelf life testing space. We're, we're very good at it. Uh, and, you know, it, it seems to be a demand from a lot of these early companies as they try to scale. If they don't have those items sorted out, it's difficult for them to get into the big retailers. Um, so it's a, a check mark that they need to have. Um, so we're, we want to continue to support companies in that space. Uh, we've recently just announced uh, funding 
uh, back in the summertime for a center for connected building technologies. Um, this is really IoT uh, type technology development space that we're working on. We haven't uh, got it operational yet, but we will be looking to take on projects in that space. Um, uh, before too long and it's not uh, limited to um, uh, like housing uh, IOT or uh, building management IOT itself. We will be exploring the needs of IOT in uh, the agri-food uh, agricultural space through that uh, program as well. That's great. Andrew, do you see any other questions in the uh, in the chat at this point? No, I haven't seen any other questions at this point. Thank you for the questions that we've received so far. Very good. Okay, well, if uh, there's no further questions, uh, just like thank everybody for, uh, for for participating today, and uh, thank you, Fanshawe College. It's been great working with you on uh, on development of this webinar, and I uh, look forward to further partnering with uh, with both you and, and others on this call uh, in the future. Great, thank you. Thanks, Todd, appreciate it. Thank you day. for having us. Yeah, no worries, thanks.